Okay, good morning everybody. I'm glad to see uh, that you guys all uh, rolled out of bed and came to our presentation. Um, very happy to be here and um, getting the day off, uh, off well and then I can relax the rest of the day. So it's kind of nice for us uh, to go first. Um, uh, we, are, we are both clinicians and uh, I'm, a, I'm a family doctor. Lauren is a naturopathic doctor doing general medicine. And as you can see from our title, we think that's pretty awesome. And, um, and so we're, we're very happy to be here. Just to uh, let you guys know a little bit about who we are. So I'm Dr. Lauren Noel. I am a naturopathic doctor, as Rick said, and I am the owner of Shine Natural Medicine. It's a naturopathic medical clinic in Solana Beach, so North County, San Diego. And I'm also the host of Dr. Low Radio, so I host a weekly podcast. I've been doing it for about three and a half years, and it's super fun, and that's what I do. And like I said, I'm a family physician. I actually do academics. I work at the University of Utah in the Department of Family Preventive Medicine. I um, spend most of my time actually teaching medical students. I teach third and fourth year medical students, and so um, that, is, that takes up the bulk of my time administering that course. And then I spend about a third of my time in clinic um, with, with everyday patients. Most of them are, are uni the kind of university community patients that I see, and a, a full uh, general practice. I see young kids to old adults, and, and that's uh, my Twitter and also Instagram, if you want to watch my pictures of my kids. So anyway, um, that's fun. So this is actually a, a, a little bit of a continuation from um, a workshop that we did last year at AHS. And that first, in that first session, we had a little more time and a little more interactive with our providers. But what we were able to do is we really related kind of our approach to, to, to patient care, kind of talking a little bit differences between um, how I was trained and how Lauren was trained and, and some of the similarities in what we do in our clinics. And then we presented three cases at that point on acne, depression, anxiety, and functional bowel disorders. We had three different patients that we, we described went through those cases. We're going to have a, a few different cases today, some similarities, um, but, um, but if you want to look back on that, we do have our slides if you're, if you're interested in looking at that first part. Uh, so. Just as a recap from that, we, we look at uh, patient care, and a lot of us will look at it differently. Depending on how you're trained, you are going to have a different approach to how you see patients. And um, there are many different uh, approaches to clinical diagnoses, a different way that you come up with your treatment plans. And this really d differs on training degree, your anecdotal evidence. And um, finding a provider that works for you um, as, as a patient is really important for our patients. So sometimes you know, people will gravitate towards one provider or another, and, and that's great. We have, um, we have no problems. I think it's great when someone finds a good provider that's going to help them out, and if it doesn't work for them or, or, or whatnot, we have different approaches to the way that we see patients. I think the key is that we collaborate as providers when we're seeing the same patient oftentimes that those differences in, in the way we approach patients can sometimes be a barrier. The more we can learn about how we approach and how we treat our patients, the more that we can work together in, in, in better communication to, to b find better outcomes for our patients. Um, the, this is a little bit of a frame of how I see patients when I'm looking at how I determine what I do or what can I do for, for management of, of helping a patient out. And the first thing I have to look at is appointment time frame. So a lot of providers have the luxury of having an hour or hour and a half, two hours um, to sit down, review patient notes, or look at things with patients a lot of time. That is not something that I have a luxury of being um, a kind of general practice doctor in a family medicine clinic. I work within the insurance uh, system. I take Medicaid. I take Medicare. So I have to follow those rules and guidelines. So most of my visits are going to be 15 or 20 minutes. I have 40 minutes for a new patient, and then subsequent visits I have 15 to 20 minutes. But what that does allow me is I can actually see my patients repeated times. So the most, all of my patients are local, and they can come back on more frequent intervals than they might uh, for another type of provider. What that does allows me is to have this more longitudinal course than it might not otherwise be possible. I also um, take insurance. And if patients have insurance, that's something that's nice for them because they're, they're not out of pocket a lot of money. So a lot of my patients, if they have Medicaid, for example, I can see them. Um, and be able to help them in a way that another provider might not be able to help. Um, and that's part number two is, as I have to look at what is their ability to pay. So there are treatments, for example, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, functional medicine regimen, for example, is not necessarily covered by insurance. So I have to figure out ways that I can work within that system of what that patient has and their ability to pay to be able to determine my treatment program. 
And then obviously also, what's the patient's level of motivation? Most of my patients are coming to me because they have to come to somebody that has their insurance. And usually they're coming to a medical doctor not expecting you know, certain, certain aspects. So if, if they're coming to me not thinking that they're going to be doing a lot with nutrition and diet, I have to kind of see where their motivation level is to make that change. And my process is oftentimes a very slow process, getting them to a place where I can see those changes um, that I want to make are going to be beneficial. Other providers, for example, the patients will seek them out and be very motivated. And sometimes that happens with me as well. Now that I'm online and people can find my profile, they come to me specifically wanting um, an ancestor health or that kind of background. So in those patients, they're very highly motivated. So if I have two different types of patients, I have to certainly create this different type of plan. And then the last one is what the patient desires for treatment. I have patients that come in and they only want meds and that's all they want. They don't want to work with anything else. And I have to work within that framework as well to, to find the best outcomes. So um, using that frame, we're going to go through a few of, of, our, of our patients. So this first patient, this is actually a patient that I had as a resident. This is before I started working in ancestral health. And this is this is our, our easy, kind of simple case that we're kind of dealing with. This is a pretty standard case of, of patients that I see now all the time. Um, and this is a patient uh, that I saw, like I said, a few years ago. So this is a 50-year-old female. She um, was a BMI of 40. She was overweight and for a long time had been looking to lose weight, become healthier. She had searched um, and, and had gone through a, a large process with many different doctors before she got to me. She was um, very active job working in an animal vivarium, so she was feeding animals all day long, very active, um, lifting, moving, um, kind of all day long, and like I said, trying to lose weight for a long time. Um, she was, she, in addition to her heavy job, she was kind of doing the, the treadmill thing, the rat race, and, and really, you know, that treadmill um, of trying to have that high energy output, but then also cutting her calories. She was, she was very detail-oriented and, and kept a very detailed, low-calorie um, type of diet. Now, she was also very motivated. Unfortunately, most of the doctors were really not believing her that she was you know, doing the things that they were telling her to do. And people kept telling her to eat less and work out more. So I, this is, she came to me, and, and I unfortunately fueled that process forward. And I was very frustrated as a provider. I was like, I cannot figure out how to help this patient. I want to help her. And nothing seems to be working. So what could we do with this patient? And, I'm gonna turn the time over to Dr. Lowe and see like, what would she have done in this situation? It's funny, we're just seeing each other's cases pretty much for the first time, so. Uh, I would say for me, I mean, it sounded like maybe cost is an issue for her, so I'd look into just educating her, having her do some of her own education, maybe reading a book. I always recommend it starts with food for most patients, because that's, you know, great background nutrition-wise, and then maybe have her listen to the podcast, because it's free. So at least just kind of have her understand a little bit more about it's not calories in, calories out, and then see what else motivation-wise she's willing to do from there, I would say. What did you do? So that's what I would have done. Unfortunately, I then graduated, and I was able to take care of her and honestly I feel bad to this day that I was not able to help that patient out luckily I have other patients I can help out now but really yeah so I mean the baseline for her really getting her on a better nutrition better exercise regimen you know more information and in her case that foundation was not in place so she really needed that foundation and then later we could have figured out if other of other techniques would have been needed but really that start exercise nutrition sleep yeah. stress reduction is where she needed to start Okay, so um, this is my more complicated patient. This patient actually came to me specifically because I was a paleo doctor. He found me online. And this is a 69-year-old with a large number of medical complaints. As you can see from the list here, I know some of you in the far back might not be able to read this, but um, he's had diabetes uh, type 2 since 1996, Graves' disease, uh, which is a thyroid disorder, severe psoriasis, which is a very bad skin disorder, prostate cancer, which was treated with uh, radiation, is, was in remission. He had ocular myasthenia gravis, which is a muscle disorder that um, causes, uh, causes the muscles of your eyes to, uh, to spasm and, then, and to, to not work very well. Um, and then he also had severe back pain, which he'd had previous spinal surgery. Um, and then also had insomnia due to muscle cramps. So this guy had a long list. So he came to my clinic with this very long list of, of complaints. And I had to see, you know, where could I go from here? What could I work on? And this is a patient who had been paleo, quote, paleo for about four months. Um, and, and fortunately, he came to me very happy. He was a very happy 69-year-old and had a very positive attitude, very motivated to make changes. 
So um, this is the list of the medications he was on. He was on pioglitazone and aglubiride and metformin. All three of those are diabetic, diabetes medications. Um, the pioglitazone and glubiride are medications that will cause insulin secretion. Metformin uh, causes an increase in sensitivity to insulin. And then he was also on level thyroxine, vitamin D3 at 5,000 units, which was great. Um, and then this pyrodostigmine, which I can't ever say, um, was for the eye disorder that he had. And then also some gabapentin for neuropathic pain due to the diabetes. So this long list of medications. Um, his diet, what he'd been doing, is pretty actually pretty uh, mainline ancestor health or paleo. Eggs for breakfast, not eating any wheat, eating chicken, fish, and, and doing really well actually with, with his diet. His son told him to do this, so he'd been doing this for about four months. He was eating potato and rice occasionally, and, and he also at times had some nausea, which the only thing that helped him with his nausea was a slice of bread. So he was doing that occasionally. Um, and then, so what, what improvements had happened in the last four months? So he, he had lost some initial weight. He was about 200 pounds. I mean, he had gone up and down in the last four months. He was very frustrated because, you know, he'd read all these success stories of people losing a lot of weight, and, and he really wasn't able to lose that weight and, and get his, uh, his disease under control. He's still on all of his medications. So uh, what's the frame? So first off, there's no way I could take care of everything in one visit. He had so many things going on. I needed to have multiple short visits with him, and that was possible. He was a Medicare patient, um, but that also, he had no outside income. He really didn't have any way of paying for anything else outside of what Medicare would pay for. Um, he was, like I said, highly motivated, and he wanted to lose weight. The cramps were a big problem in his life, and then he wanted to, he was motivated to stop some of his medications. So um, what would you have done in this, at this start? Well, in my situation with patients I see, typically they're seeking me out. They do have some more, you know, income that they can do some testing. So if I had the option of doing testing, I would probably look for hidden infections. It sounds like diet-wise, he's been dialed in for about four months. He's had some improvements, but I would just want to do a little bit more digging. Maybe look at um, hidden infections, maybe in the gut. We know that gut infections can definitely contribute to diabetes. Um, maybe look at doing some cortisol testing, hormone testing, that kind of thing, because he's doing a lot of the lifestyle things already. And then also a lot of um, micronutrient deficiency testing. Maybe he's deficient in chromium. Maybe he's deficient in zinc. You know, look at see if there's something that, that way that is really getting in the way of that blood sugar regulation. So, but I think you're on the right track. Why don't you say what you did? Okay, so I did not do all of that. Um, some of it was, was constrained by my knowledge. I don't know how to do all that, those fun, like, different tests, all the micronutrients. I just don't simply do that in my practice very often. Um, but also constrained by a lot of the funds that he had. He really didn't have a lot of funds to do um, a lot of that testing. So what did I do? My initial patient instructions really were, okay, keep doing what you're doing, and I need more time to figure out how to help you. Um, we didn't actually make any changes that first visit. I wanted to build that rapport with that patient first before I kind of threw a lot of different changes that I wanted him to do. He really had high expectations to make, to make changes, and he really needed a, a perspective that he was 69 and been living with this, these diseases for a long time. It was going to take a long time to get him back to a place of, of better health. Um, and this is actually a word for word. I just copy and pasted my instructions to him um, from a couple years ago when I saw him. So then I wanted to see him back. And he had already had some lab tests already done by his previous provider. So rather than just doing those tests again, I wanted those back so I didn't have to um, incur, incur more costs. So uh, three weeks later, he came back. His weight had not changed in three weeks. He kept that diet. So what we decided to do is to stop both his pioglitazone and his glibiride, but to continue his metformin. In my mind, what I thought is if we stopped these insulinogenic uh, medications, hopefully what would happen is he would then have this ability maybe to lose some more weight um, in a frame um, that, would, that would work better. What we had hoped we, in, in general is that if, since he's already eating much better at a lower carb diet, his A1C, which is the way we track diabetes, would stabilize and not increase. And that was the fear is that if he had his A1C go up after we stopped these two medications, then we're going to be in real trouble and we would maybe have to start them again. Because really what we want to do is to not have any end organ damage, lose, losing his eyesight or worsening neuropathy for him. Um, he also had these muscle cramps. This is one of his biggest issues. He just simply couldn't sleep. He had been on magnesium in the past, which helped. Unfortunately, that magnesium made his eye disease a lot worse and he had trouble seeing. So we really couldn't do a lot of magnesium. He was on, quite a, he was on about 2,000 uh, milligrams of magnesium a day, which is where it was that helped. Um, but this was causing problems with his eyesight. So what we decided to do is just right now hold on to that and see if we can improve that over time, but really not make changes there. He also, we started him on a higher dose of fish oil and we continued the, the 5,000 units of vitamin D. Um, so what were the results? 
So um, first off, we were able to maintain his diabetic control. So we, this is in May that I saw him first, or when we made the changes. His A1C was 5.9. We want to keep an A1C below 7 to have good diabetic control. In July, when we rechecked it a few months later, it was 6.2. So I was very happy with that. We did see a little bit of a bump, but probably within the range of error of our test. But really, we were still doing very well. This is after stopping both of those medications. So I was very happy. Um, and then, as you can see, in October, um, we were able to maintain, um, maintain that. And this was, like I said, this is in 2012, so about two years ago. Um, and this is the, the most exciting thing of what happened. So, as you can see, he was able to have significant weight loss. This was after stopping those two medications that caused, you know, that insulin production. He was continuing on very much the same diet. We had made no changes. We, actually, sorry, we, we did cut his carbs a little bit more from what he had been doing, but really no significant changes of what he'd been doing the previous four months where he hadn't been able to lose weight. So in this case, I think the, the direct result of stopping those two medications was that weight loss. As you can see, you know, he had a, this nice steady weight loss until he, he got down to a, to a better level here. So here's the problem, though. He was still having severe back pain, which limited his, his, his ability to move, exercise, et cetera. Um, we, um, oh, sorry, in, in the, in not that first visit, but in between some of those visits, we had decided to try magnesium again, but at a lower dose. It, it did help out a little bit, but did worsen his eyes. So we, his cramps were ongoing. So he wasn't able to figure out anything to do with his cramps at that point. And then we saw a significant improvement in his skin psoriasis. And that was actually one thing that he really um, felt very positive about, was that his psoriasis was getting much better. And that was four months of his diet and then six months after seeing me. So it took about 10 months for his skin really to start improving after um, improving his diet. Okay, so now what? So this is where we are. We've gotten to this point. Now what, what would we do? And I want you guys to think as clinicians here, what would you have done at this point with this patient? Where could you go? What changes could you make um, at this point? What are some long-term things and what are some limitations? Maybe I can take like one or two people if they just have one suggestion of maybe something that they would have tried. From the, for the myasthenia, the ocular, is, this is a personal view, um, you know, since, you know, 35 years with it. Uh, so, and the mesonon, the drug that he takes, will cause ins really significant insomnia. I don't know how much he's on, but I don't know if you were aware of that or picked that up in the literature, but... I, w I wasn't that, aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. But that drug in and of itself can... Can yeah, so that. trying to find that balance of the side effects of the medication versus his vision, it's really hard to know, and, and, and that's somewhere where I, as a general physician, really kind of put that in the other wheelhouse. Maybe I could have taken a more active role Thioma. in working with that. What was that? Thioma. Thioma, okay. He did not have thioma. No, he, he, he did not. Okay, so good. So looking at possible other diagnoses that could be causing some of these issues, maybe broadening our differential to look at other things. Uh, is this on? Yep. Um, I would look to see what about what's happening with his back pain. Um, you know, just because he's on Neurontin doesn't mean that he's actually going to be um, helped, and maybe there's something that you can actually do about that. Maybe there's some specific problem. Um, and I like to send people with back pain to physical therapy for evaluation because it is covered by insurance. Um, so, you know, I would look at that more because that sounds like another significant problem for him. Okay, good. Yeah, so that's actually what we did. Uh, one of his majors was that back pain and was preventing him from having some of the other outcomes. Um, so he, he did go through some physical therapy. He went back to his, his, his uh, back surgeon to get another, to get another review. And, um, and that's something that he continued to work on. Um, he uh, continued to try to exercise and has, has started swimming and doing some other types of exercise that didn't require, um, you know, it, sorry, didn't cause an increase in, in his back pain. So uh, let's look at what happened long term. So this is where we are now. In, interven in, in, in the intervening years, we've done quite a few different treatments for him. We um, have tried changes in his diet. We've tried super low carb. We, we've tried a variety of, of aspects. Um, to try to improve what's been going on. I don't want to kind of talk at all about those, but um, in, in, in the two years that I've had him, his A1C has basically stayed at the exact same place, which has been very reassuring. 
Um, we haven't changed his medications. He's been on his diet, and it's been very good. His A1C has been controlled, and, and that's been probably the most promising thing, is that um, that, that, that has stayed um, in, a, in a good place. Um, one thing that has been frustrating for, for him especially is we saw this initial great weight loss, and this is, um, so the, the last slide I showed you was right here. So 177, he got down to, so this was 200, so his BMI was 32. He got down to here, and then in the next year, in the next uh, year, he was able to drop down to 160, so he dropped another 15, uh, 15 pounds of body fat um, to, where, to, a, to where BMI, who was very happy. Then what happened is I actually didn't see him for about six months. Um, our our, our follow-up wasn't as tight as it had been, and he actually gained quite a bit of weight. Um, and, and this kind of inflection point, we're able to kind of stabilize here. But something that's happened is we don't, I, I have looked at a variety of things and haven't really been able to figure out why he hasn't had more, more weight loss. And, and, and I think part of, part of this was the back pain. He really became even more limited than he was before and really, um, really had a hard time um, at this point. Now, the good news is, you know, this isn't terrible for someone with diabetes. Sticking at, at this weight probably, you know, isn't the worst thing. Is A1C is controlled, and, and is this the worst? It's, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly okay or, ha you know, happy with what thing, way things are going, but I think it would be an improvement to get him to a little bit healthier weight. Um, this is uh, his lipid profile. A lot of, you know, with some with diabetes, we're always looking at, at someone's cholesterol, making sure that that is at an appropriate level. And in the literature, someone with diabetes um, should have much tighter control than other people. Um, this is, these are his lipids over the last two years. Actually, this is in 2010 before he started anything paleo, before he saw me at all. I was able to pull out from the records. His total cholesterol was 154 and his LDL was 89, which, you know, when, when Dr. Lowe saw this first, she was like, oh, wow, that was really low. And his, his cholesterol, you know, improved through time as, as, as he had, you know, better nutrition. You know, one thing that I saw when I was here in November 2013 is you see this very upward trend. His LDL was going up and up and up, and I was actually getting a little worried that, you know, if it kept going up, you know, how, what am I going to do as a provider that really should be thinking, you know, by the literature of putting him on an intensive statin therapy? If this patient, you know, is not on intensive statin therapy, I have to be able to justify that in some way. Um, and then what, what happened actually earlier this year, it, it more stabilized around 116 as his LDL. And, and I think for him, this is probably a healthy cholesterol panel. And, and I actually have decided not to make any change with that. Um, in the past, because of his other uh, medical problems, he hasn't even been able to take a statin for very long because he had muscle issues um, that happened. But um, that's something that ongoing needing to look at as, you know, as a provider in the system is, is making sure that you know, this isn't completely out of control. And so I do test to make sure that his lipids are in a, in a good balance. Um, and really not made, decide not to make any changes from there. So um, other issues, kind of long term over the last couple years, his, his cramps have improved. So over the last two years, without much other treatment besides the nutrition and actually increase in his exercise, the cramps have improved greatly. He did have uh, an additional spinal surgery. Um, that was about six months ago that he, that he had that. And actually, his mobility has greatly improved. We don't always recommend someone to have surgery, but for him it was the right choice. And actually his exercise tolerance and mobility has, has, has improved a lot. So he's been able to get out and exercise a lot more and, and his mood and everything else has been improved. Um, unfortunately, he also then recently had IBS-like symptoms that had started that he didn't have in the past. Um, this helped with low FODMAP, but now that Dr. Lowe brought up gut infections, this is maybe think, you know, starting to think like maybe something else is going on his inability to lose weight, and maybe, maybe I should be looking at something like that. So, um, all right, so any other thoughts for my patient, Dr. Lowe? Well, I'm really impressed. I think there's a ton of improvements with him. I mean, getting him off of a couple of different medications and his BMI has improved a ton. Um, but I would look maybe a little bit more of the root of what's happening. And we know autoimmune disease is caused from leaky gut. So maybe there's something going on there. I mean, the psoriasis, the myasthenia gravis, those are both autoimmune conditions. Um, so seeing if there's an infection there. And then maybe he has chronic high cortisol. You know, maybe that's making it hard for him to lose weight and his, his weight is just staying on. So just doing a little bit more digging if he's able to financially. But, I mean, I think he's been really, you know, obviously helped a lot. So just a couple of little areas to dig further, I would say. But, yeah. Okay. okay.
All right, thank you. So that was, those are, that, was my, uh, that was my patient. Obviously, there's a lot more information there that we can talk about later if you're interested in, in talking about him. I'm going to turn the time over to Dr. Lowe. And then forward is this one right here. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to chime in and talk about a couple of cases um, in my practice, and then I'd love to have Dr. Henriksen um, give any other ideas if, if there's something that maybe I miss and maybe big, you know, like red flags or something that I'm, you know, kind of um, glancing over. But so, okay. So patient number one, so this is a 37-year-old African-American female. Um, I've been seeing her for about a year and a half, two years now. And uh, she presented to me, she had already been doing paleo for several months. She was a heavy crossfitter. Um, she had severe cystic acne. So, I mean, it's probably the worst case of acne I'd ever seen. I, I wish I had a picture to show you guys, but it was like her face was just covered with cystic acne. Um, she had a history of PCOS, so polycystic ovarian syndrome and did have a history of ovarian cysts because you don't always have cysts in that condition, but she actually did. And she had irregular cycles. Um, she was just really tired and difficulty losing weight despite eating paleo and exercising. I think she's doing CrossFit like four or five times a week. Um, she had sig significant gas and bloating. She felt like she was like three months pregnant most of the time and just felt really depressed, anxiety. She had been seeing a counselor for a while and it was making some improvement, but just still was just feeling kind of blah. Um, she also mentioned that she had difficulty remembering things and she would slur her speech sometimes. She'd be talking to someone and just lose her train of thought and then just start stuttering. So that was really affecting her. So these are the different labs that we ran. So my practice is a little different. We can do out-of-pocket testing so I can run the full you know, gamut of tests, which is nice. Um, not everyone can do that, but this is what we did for her. So we ran um, complete blood count, uh, comprehensive metabolic panel. We ran our vitamin D, um, CRPs so looking at inflammation. Uh, homocysteine, lipids, and then a full thyroid panel, which included um, TSH, free T3, free T4, and her antibodies. So just seeing if she has um, any autoimmune process with that. We ran a stool test, so OMP times three um, bacteria culture, and then look for H. pylori. And then we did uh, salivary cortisol testing and sex hormones on day 21 of her cycle to see um, how especially her progesterone peak looked. And then we also did micronutrient deficiency testing to see what vitamins and minerals she was low in. And then our initial plan, we did a liver cleansing smoothie, um, which is a rice protein powder. So I do some rice protein for patients when they tolerate it. Um, we did 30 billion um, CFUs of probiotics and then 3,000 milligrams of omega-3s to start. And then we started also on IM injections. So um, B6, B12, MIC, which is methionine and acetal and choline, and those are liver lipotropics. So they start to help the liver, you know, um, detox and process fats. And then also started on um, injections of vitamin A. So we saw her back a few weeks later, and um, she mentioned that her digestion had felt better. She had no more dizziness, which I forgot to mention. She was feeling really dizzy. She's lost 10 pounds since we started. And um, her lab testing showed that she had elevated liver enzymes, so AST and ALT, and also high ferritin. I think her ferritin was in the upper, two, like maybe 270. Um, also elevated blood sugar, elevated A1C. She had elevated nighttime cortisol, which contributed to insomnia, which I didn't mention, and then decreased progesterone. She had elevated testosterone, and then um, low serotonin. We also did urine um, uh, neurotransmitter testing, and then she had positive H. pylori. So looking at all these things, it's like, oh my gosh, what do we do first? So what I initially started her with, I treated her H. pylori, so I've used Matula T for that. So I've learned that I don't have to use antibiotics. It's worked 100% of the time. It's amazing. Matula T is just incredible for H. pylori. And um, you can order it online. I don't even carry it in my office, but they have, there's a website. I, I can give you guys the link if you want it. Um, but if, it's, if you end up retesting and it's actually positive, you get your money back for the tea. So they, they really stand behind it. Um, and the, the website looks really like sketchy. It looks like it's like an internet scam, but it's legit, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is her micronutrient testing. So she was deficient in glutathione, CoQ10, and selenium, which interestingly, those are all antioxidants. And she lives in LA in a pretty highly populated um, neighborhood. So it was kind of an interesting connection to see with that. So we addressed those deficiencies with supplementation. So here's what I did with her. And some of this is um, in the beginning, some of this is eventually, this is over time, but we did liver supportive herbs. So milk thistle and dandelion root. Um, we did blood, blood sugar support with chromium and zinc and also some glandulars, so liver, pancreas, and pituitary to support the HPA axis. We also did maca. Um, Zia Gold is a heavy metal chelator, and that also I found can decrease ferritin when it's elevated, which we did. I'll show you the lab work, but we did see that that decreased her ferritin. I started her on uh, d -pinitol, which is my version of metformin, basically, so it helps to um, sensitize the cells to insulin. We put her on selenium um, for the deficiency and also for liver or sorry, um, thyroid support. 
I changed up her, her shot formula, so I added in um, methylfolate, glutathione, and also CoQ10 based on her deficiency. I also told her to go donate blood because I thought her ferritin was just a little high. And then I did start her on progesterone in the luteal phase um, and then the, the metula T. Fortunately, she didn't mind taking pills. <laughs> So saw her back a few um, months later. Her skin was 70 to 80 percent better, and we didn't do anything topical. That's the exciting part about that. We treated her gut, we treated her hormones, her deficiencies, and her skin just got so much better. Her bloating was gone. We retested her for uh, H. pylori, and it was gone. Her dizziness was gone. She continued weight loss. Um, by the way, I also had her cut back on her exercise. I said, no more CrossFit. You can't CrossFit for three months. And it was like a death sentence for her. She was so sad, but she just started walking, which she hated. But it really helped her because she was just way too stressed. I mean, her, her adrenal panel was just off the charts, and she was just really wiped out. And that really helped. And now she's getting back into CrossFitting again. Her mood improved. Her cycles became more regular. And then her, um, now she has occasional migraines, which I, I did mention she was getting them on a pretty um, consistent basis. So this is her lab work prog progression over a year and a half. So initially she had an elevated MCV, so really megaloblastic anemia, suggesting the, the B12 and folate deficiency. And over time that did go down. Her ferritin was at 252, which is you know, showing either inflammation or high iron. And that also did decrease over time as well. And really I found that working on the liver can help, very much help to do that. And then her AST and ALT also dropped as well. Upon retesting, about six months later, we found she didn't have any micronutrient deficiencies. This is through SpectraCell. This is who I run my um, micronutrient defici deficiency testing through. And then, Dr. Hendrickson, any? Words? Well, it seems like you did just about everything there. Um, <laughs> I had some suggestions, but then you talked about them. The first one, I was going to talk about overtraining. So it seemed yeah. like um, she was probably overtrained. And one thing you didn't really address as much is what was her sleep like. And in this case, I think probably improving her sleep. Uh, it sounds like you did try to, you know, that, that could have been a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then this, is, this could have been the case in, um, where metformin could have been an effect for that patient. For sure. It's hard, though, because she started with, with gut issues. So giving someone metformin, which can cause some side effects with the gut, is a problem. But it could sensitize her and improve some of the symptoms. But it um, sounds like you were using, I don't even know what, that D-Benetol, yeah. um, which has a similar action. Yeah. So. And, and D-Pinitol deep deep is very expensive. I think it's per bottle, it's like a hundred something dollars. So in some situations, metformin might be better. I'm not anti-metformin. I think it could be a great you know, drug for many people. You just have to watch out for B12 deficiency with that. So second patient, I'll, I think, how am I doing on time? I have eight minutes. I can do that. Okay, so this is uh, patient number two. And after this, if I have time, I'd love to hear from you guys if there's any other ideas that you have. So this is um, a 30-year-old female, mother of two. She was re referred to me by her gastroenterologist, which was really exciting because I didn't even know who this person was. This is like a first, like, whoa, okay, this is, this is a compliment, you know? And medical doctors referring to me is great. So her history, um, ulcerative colitis, she was being treated with um, mesalamine and prednisone suppositories. And she was hospitalized for severe colitis. They found it in her descending sigmoid and her rectum. So descending in sigmoid colon and rectum. And um, at one point, her weight loss was so bad, she was 93 pounds. And she was having two bowel movements every hour. So she was really, really, really sick. And um, she had a history of being gluten-free. She had one slip up. And she had more blood in her stool than she had ever had before. So she was just incredibly sensitive. Significant gas and bloating. She looked like she was seven months pregnant, and she wasn't. So she was so frustrated because she was actually really thin, but she came in and it was like, whoa. Her stomach was just so distended. Her energy was so low. She had so much anxiety. She had really bad insomnia, and her hair was like straw. It just looked so dull. I mean, she looked like, like she, she looked like she was very unhealthy. You know, just, I mean, really, you could see the, the pale skin. It was almost like a grayish tone to it. So uh, she brought in some lab work from her primary care. She was in urgent care soon before that, and her white blood cell count was really, really high. So ideally, I like to see the white count between 5 and 8, and hers at 17.9, so a real acute infection. And her neutrophils were at 91%, so it was really shifted towards the bacterial side. And lymphocytes were 6%. I'd never seen lymph so low. Her vitamin D was at 18 and her stool, we did a stool test, and she had um, elevated lactoferrin, which is something that differentiates IBS from IBD. So it was confirming that it was inflammatory bowel disease. And then she also had a deficiency in biotin, calcium, and copper. I mean, so, just to break in real yeah. quick, I mean, like, this patient is very sick. Yeah. When, I, when I see this, I mean, almost, 
almost to the point of admission. I mean, she's, she's very sick. Yeah. So she did say, you know, I did have more recent lab work. I'm getting the results. So, th so they faxed them over to the office, and they were much different um, a couple weeks later. So it showed that that acute flare had passed. That way I, I felt more comfortable treating her. Because if I were to see this, I'd say, you need to go back to the ER. I, I can't see you yet. You're just a little bit too sick. So... Um, the plan, what we did for her once she did come back and her labs were, were a bit better, is we put her on the specific carbohydrate diet with our dietitian. We work with Stephanie Granke, she's amazing if you guys ever need a dietitian. And we put her on a gut healing smoothie which had a significant amount of um, glutamine in it. So it was a rice protein powder um, with glutamine. We put her on a high dose probiotic, so 225 billion per day, and then a tablespoon of cod liver oil. And then we started her on IVs. She lives up in, I think, North LA, and I'm in San Diego. And I said, you need to come down here every week. We need to start doing IVs for you. And that was really hard for her to swing because she had two kids. You know, she was really busy, but she made it happen. And that made a huge difference for her. So I prescribed it two times a week. She only was able to do once a week. But we did magnesium, selenium, zinc, all the B vitamins, calcium, trace minerals, vitamin C, and glutathione. And then we also did um, twice a week of IM injections that she took home. I was doing this, um, so I kept those in the fridge and did those at home. So um, also, I had her do a blood sugar balancing formula as well, which made a big difference for her because she was very jittery. Whenever she skipped a meal, she felt really dizzy. We put her on Saccharomyces boulardii, um, HCL and pepsin for absorption, selenium, biotin, and then calcium magnesium citrate based on her nutrient deficiency tests. So I've been working with her for about maybe six to eight months, and now the update is she has so much more energy. She goes once a day, so bowel movement once a day. She has no blood or mucus in her stool. Um, she is still on the specific carbohydrate diet. I think she's still on phase one or two, so it's a still a very restrictive diet, but she's happy to do it because it's making a big difference for her, and eventually we'll get her to the next phases. Her mood is better. She's now able to play with her kids, and she said that's just made a huge difference because before she had to just sleep all day. She wasn't able to really be there for them. Her bloating is much better. Now she looks about maybe three months pregnant, so she still is bloated, and I would love to maybe hear more ideas of what you guys have with that. Um, and her, this is her recent lab, so her white count 4.1, neutrophils and lymphs were in normal range. Her vitamin, okay, her vitamin D shot up to 74. Um, she is negative for SIBO, because I wanted to look into that, but we found out recently that she is positive for Epstein-Barr virus, and so now we were treating that. So the treatment, just continue the plan. I did put her on a homeopathic remedy for Epstein-Barr, and um, just some other support, monolaurin is antiviral, and then prescript assist, I switched her to a different probiotic, and we're gonna be retesting her labs. So, um, for the sake of time, I'm going to just jump into the next section. Um, do you have any other ideas? <laughs> um, for the sake of time, why don't we just move okay, on? Okay, we'll just move on. Okay, so I just want to share a couple different ideas I have for working with other providers. So number one is if you're working, if you're a medical doctor and you're working with NDs or vice versa, just number one, please just show respect to the other providers. Never talk bad about providers to the patient. I hear doctors do this a lot of times where they, they just talk crap about each other and it's just not, it looks really unprofessional, so just don't ever do that. Keep other doctors in the loop. So in this situation with the patient with ulcerative colitis, I could have done a better job of staying in contact with her medical doctors and I, I just didn't do that and I definitely you know, see an area of improvement for me. Um, leave the ego at the door. Don't feel like you gotta puff yourself up and like you know better than other providers. You know, keep that humility. Um, and if another provider is rude, don't take it personally. It's probably their own stuff and has nothing to do with you. So to NDs, DCs, other holistic providers, tri triple check drug herb interactions. There's a lot of different interactions. Not all herbs are safe. Just because it's natural, it doesn't mean it's safe. Arsenic is natural and that's definitely not safe. So <laughs> make sure to just check on that and just have open communication with, with other providers. And then to MDs and DOs, please have honesty. If you don't know something, please be real about it. You don't have to say, oh, don't take that. If you don't know, look into it. Have an open mind about it. And so if it's something foreign to you, be open about learning that and then just be open with other providers. Um, this is our contact information, and do you want to say anything else? Um, I guess just, so these are two websites you can go to. Dr. Uh, L uh, Lauren's website is, is pretty great. Um, if you're in the San Diego area, check her out. And then um, if you are an MD or DO, this is a website for our organization called Physicians and Ancestral Health. It's at ancestraldoctors.org. And um, we are meeting with a few um, of our uh, physician friends, uh, MD and DOs at, at at noon today, we love working with with other types of providers. And if you um, if you want to collaborate in any way, we would love to collaborate with you guys, and that would that would be fantastic. So thank you for your time, and that's thank it. You.